shamanic mysticism book the shamanic wisdom of the pyramid text uh, or shamanic wisdom in the pyramid text the mystical tradition of ancient Egypt by Jeremy Nadler continue on <clears throat> page 27 the Egyptians were concerned with philosophical questions questions about being and non-being about the meaning of death about the nature of the cosmos and human nature and about many other philosophical, cosmological, and theological issues. Page 29, the knowledge of the Egyptian section. Francis Bacon's The Advancement of Learning, 1605, which set forth the vision of, the, of a universal science within which all knowledge would be incorporated through a slow, cumulative process fueled by continuing and systematic research. In this paradigm, scientific knowledge is purged of personal opinion, feeling, or value judgment in order to attain an impersonal and objective description of reality. It does this by pursuing a method methodology that stresses empirical observation, the ability of third parties to repeat observations and experiments, and the formulation of explanatory theories that will be open to modification or refutation by subsequent observations. Its objectivity is thus guaranteed, whereas the insights, visions, or revelations of religious or mystical experiences are viewed as irredeemably subjective, impossible to verify or repeat by third parties, and thus unreliable sources of knowledge. Page 31. R. A. Swaller de Lubitz, who, despite his detailed study of the theoretical principles and practical application of ancient Egyptian mathematics in the Temple of Man and his studies of ancient Egyptian esotericism, esotericism and symbolism in this and other works remains virtually ignored by the Egypt Egyptological establishment. In the Temple of Man, Swallow de Lupus argues, like many before him, that the learning of the Greeks was largely derivative of and lagged behind the much more comprehensive metaphysical understanding of the Egyptians. His explanations for the difference between the Egyptian and the Greek methods of acquiring knowledge is that the Greeks isolated and abstracted the analytical faculty from its metaphysical and symbolic locus on in the Egyptian religious consciousness. The Egyptian priests dedicated their entire lives to the thought and contemplation of God. The fruit of their contemplation of God was knowledge, and through contemplation and knowledge they attained to a way of life at once esoteric and old-fashioned. It was a life of wisdom. The ancient Egyptians valued and prioritized mystical knowledge acquired through exalted states of consciousness. And this, as we shall see, is to a large extent what is documented in the sacred texts that have come down to us. This is page 32, by the way. Ancient, Egypt, ancient Egyptian science was above all directed towards the immaterial causes that lie behind the events of the world and the goal of knowledge was the experience of the spiritual causes or powers. Ecstatic contact with the divine. Page, page 49. While scholars generally accept that, that this voluntary death was one of the central aims of the Greek and Hellenistic mystery cults, Egyptology has resisted the idea that any such initiatory rites or experiences existed in Egypt. The key note against any such rites or in ancient Egypt was hold on the key note against any such rites in ancient Egypt was struck by Siegfried Morins, who, in his influential book Egyptian Religion, compared the role of Isis and Osiris in the Hellenistic mysteries, which is ancient Greek, uh, with their role in ancient Egypt in the following way, whereas the later Hellenistic mysteries sought to elevate the mystic to the divine plane by associating him with Isis and Osiris in ancient Egypt, the deceased becomes Osiris and enters into God by the performance of the funerary rites, or Atum. Between ancient Egypt and the Hellenistic world, a radical transformation took place, and this transformation 
consists in the following. In Egypt it was the dead, whereas in the Hellenistic world it was the living, who were so consecrated and thereby saved from their state of worldly terror. This sounds just like the um, uh, believe in Jesus, repent, you're saved type thing. And that represents the living people who are living on earth right now. Which means that you can kill somebody, go home at night and repent that you did it and you will be washed away from your sins. It wasn't like that in ancient Kemet, but it was like that apparently in the Hellenistic into uh, Greek, Greek times. <clears throat> the argument of Morin's is that where we find mysticism in the Hellenistic world, we find funerary rites in Egypt. Okay, now I find that to be uh, incorrect because the funerary rites that were uh, played out in Egypt were literal uh, mystical rites that did not reflect just funerary situations or, you know, doing this during the time of somebody's funeral or something. These were initiatory steps that for instance the king had to go through in order for him to be king of Egypt upper and lower because he needs to be in contact with intermediary worlds interdimensional realities and um, basically the Duat realm and in communication with this realm as well and being the mediator of the uh, the realm of the deceased or the realm of the spirits and the realm, uh, realm of the living page 51 the section mysticism and the experience of death the association of mystical experience with the experiences that one will have at death is by no means an unusual association only to be found in a few hermetic texts it is also central to shamanic initiation rites which often involve not only the experience of dismemberment or reduction to the state of a skeleton but also a descent to the underworld or an ascent to heaven and the further experience of spiritual rebirth this initiatory pattern in which the main mystical experience was to travel into the realm of the dead was common throughout the ancient world it was the central experience of initiation unto the mysteries a well-known philosophical example of the teaching concerning the mystical experience slash death experience parallel can be found in the dialogues of Plato, particularly important because of their influence on later mystics and mystically inclined philosophers. Plato was reputed to have spent 13 years studying in ancient Egypt under the tutelage of priests, so an Egyptian source of this teaching cannot be discounted. It is most clearly expounded in his dialogue Phaedrus, which has been called the basic text of mysticism in the true sense, for it is described for it describes in most evocative and or evocative and elated language the ascent of the human being to the divine world. This ascent is accomplished by the soul growing wings. In this beautiful image of the soul becoming winged, and hence capable of moving upward away from the earth and the world of matter, Plato affirms that the human being has a celestial as well as a terrestrial home. The way to return to our celestial home is by cultivating the spiritual qualities of beauty, wisdom, goodness, and every other excellence. Through nourishing ourselves on these sublime qualities, we not only grow wings but also realize our own immortality, lifting ourselves beyond the sphere of the earth to the stars. There, the winged soul meets Zeus, <laughs> i.e. Jesus, and a host of gods and spirits at the summit of the arch of the heavens. Going beyond even this arch, it con contemplates an indescribable reality. Quote, the reality with which true knowledge is concerned, a reality without color or shape, intangible but utterly real, apprehensible only by intellect, which is the pilot of the soul. Uh, he speaks a lot more on Plato, but um, I'm going to go ahead and continue on. It's, it's on page 52 if you want to get the book. Okay. Shamanic Wisdom in the Pyramid Text, The Mythical Traditions of Ancient Egypt by Jeremy Nadler. Continuing on. Page 56. Um, continue, continuing on about the mysticism of the uh, death experience <clears throat> while alive. 
More than a thousand years earlier in ancient Mesopotamia, a similar initiatory encounter with death was central to the Mesopotamia, uh, central to the Akitu or New Year festival. He's referring to um, more than a thousand years earlier. He's referring to uh, Plato's time. So more than a thousand years before Plato's time. Okay. During this festival, the death and resurrection of the god Marduk was reenacted. He, Marduk, descended into the underworld and was mourned for three days before he rose again triumphantly. The role of Marduk was taken by the king who was ritually disrobed and confined in the mountain. Uh, the ziggurat for the prescribed length of time and then liberated to the jubilation of the gathered crowds. Okay. Um, here, then, we seem to have a mystery rite that, in essential respects, both mythological and experiential, parallels the Greek and Hellenistic mystery rites. Where, where it differs from the Greek and Hellenistic models is that, apparently, only one person, the king, went through the experience of death and resurrection on behalf of the whole community. Given the overall context of the Akitu, which means literally, power making the world live again, it is likely that what the king underwent and later on in the festival enacted in the sacred marriage rite was felt to affect the whole country and its populace. In this respect, the effects of the Akitu or uh, the New Year festival bear comparison with certain passages in the pyramid texts that indicate, as well as the, the, the Gospels of the New Testament, uh, that indicate that through the king's transformation and rebirth, the land of Egypt was renewed, the grass was made green, and the fields became fertile. These considerations should cause us to approach the ancient Egyptian pyramid texts with an awareness that although they appear concerned with the fate of the soul after death, they may belong to a similar mystical tradition to the Mesopotamian Akitu and that the experiences the Pharaoh underwent were regarded as benefiting the whole country. According to this mystical tradition in crossing the threshold, okay, crossing the threshold, okay, that separates the world of the living from the realm of the dead. A connection was made with the vitalizing energies that are mediated by the dead into the world of the living. Very key. The fact that the mystical near-death experience appears to have been central not only in the mystery rites of Greek and Hellenistic times, but also in ancient Mesopotamia, clearly weakens the argument of Morins, Hornung, Osman and others discussed at the beginning of this chapter that implies that such rites were a post pharaonic development only for the Mesopotamian Akitu goes back to the third millennium BC was already well established at the time of the Egyptian Middle Kingdom and probably dates back to before that period okay um, if we find these rites in Mesopotamia, then the likelihood that something similar also existed in ancient Egypt is considerably increased. There is, however, a good deal of evidence that, or to suggest that, this same understanding and ritual practice flourished in many other ancient cultures contemporaneous with Pharaonic Egypt, such as the Minoan, Ugaritic, Hittite, and so on. The reputation of Egypt throughout the ancient world for being a fount of esoteric wisdom uh, was was uh, extremely significant, enormously significant. Okay. Okay. The god who presided over death and rebirth was Osiris. Okay. We need, therefore, to look at the figure of Osiris in order to ascertain whether this funerary god might not also have played an initiatory role in an Egyptian mystical tradition. Page 59. Within the pyramid texts, however, there are a great many references to the supposedly dead king as Horus. Instead of it just being Osiris and then Horus being the living king, there is uh, within the pyramid text 
actual evidence and references of Osiris or of Horus being a dead king. Okay, which is more than likely Osiris as the dead king living in the uh, realm of Amenta, where the deceased souls resides, and who are dumb, deaf, and blind until Horus comes to heal them. The amount of references to the dead king as Horus in the pyramid texts, however, militates against simply dismissing them as exceptions to the general rule. It is, moreover, often instructive to examine exactly under what circumstances the dead king is in the Horus role. To take one example which appears in the Pyramid of Unas, the king states, I am Heru, my father's heir. I have gone and returned. Elsewhere, it is as Horus that the king rests in life in the West, i.e. the underworld, and then, like the sun, shines anew in the East. The dead king is not always in Osiris. This is a... Uh, basically incontrovertible evidence I mean it is literally written in the text themselves so no one can argue the fact that not only was um, Horus looked at I mean Osiris looked at as the deceased king in the underworld Horus was as well okay uh, he, he begins on page 59 with a section called the resurrection texts which I believe are extremely important this is utterance 373 of the pyramid texts oh ho oh ho raise yourself O king receive your head collect your bones gather your limbs together throw off the earth from your flesh now from what has just been read um, Brexit would think that the person is actually deceased and they're doing a funerary right for the deceased person Okay, but the author basically argues and he asks the question, um, can we be certain that this rising from the dead is a post-mortem event? What is actually being described is the remembering of his dismembered body, head, bones, and limbs. Suppose the king has only temporarily died in the mystical sense of traveling through the dismemberment experience that identifies him with Osiris. At the end of the very same utterance, it is stated quite categorically, Rise up, O king, for you have not died. See, for Breasted, James Breasted, uh, there is little doubt that this and other passages asserting that the king is in fact alive are simply expressing the favorite belief of the Assyrian faith that through identifying with Osiris after one has died, one wins through to an eternal postmortem life. Bresta goes on to quote a famous utterance that appears in the Pyramid of Unas in order to demonstrate that the union of the dead king with Osiris assures the king, despite his death, of eternal life. The utterance reads, He lives this Unas lives. He is not dead. This Unas is not dead. He is not gone down. This Unas is not gone down. As Breasted says, these asseverations are repeated over and over and addressed to every god of the Inyad that each may be called upon to witness their truth. When we are presented with statement after statement affirming that the king, as Osiris, has not died, has it has in fact overcome death and indeed lives surely it is incumbent upon the reader of the pyramid text to ask whether the text may perhaps be wanting to convey the fact that the king is indeed not dead does it not after all require a certain straining of the meaning of these statements to interpret them as descriptions of a king who is dead how else could they have been stated That's just a section that he's arguing to breast it about. He continues on with that. It's a very good argument he has. Uh, now, page 61. In the pyramid texts, there are a great many utterances in addition to utterance 373, quoted above, in which the king as Osiris is told to wake up. Uh, stand up, shake the dust off his feet, and take possession of his body. 
These resurrection utterances are usually understood simply as an expression of the human protest against death, a denial of its reality. Within Egyptology, this has become the standard view. <laughs> Uh, Gwen, uh, J. Gwen Griffiths uses this view in his book The Origins of the Osiris Cult um, and he goes on and on to talk about that um, let me see here the, Egyptians, the Egyptian word for body used in the utterance to which Griffiths refers is jet which normally means the living body uh, it sounds so much like the king actually reviving that to interpret it otherwise we should have to impute to the text a naive denial of the reality of death that is to say the egyptians despite all appearances to the contrary insisted that the dead king actually stood up again in his physical body this is indeed the way griffiths choose to explain it and this is what's going on today okay mm, this is the propaganda of the dead king is of, of the of the king is dead then seeing him alive again in the body itself um, Uh, it goes on and on. Um, let's see here. I don't want to quote that. He has a section called Horus who is in Osiris. Um, basically, I'll come back and continue on that. This is part two. Um, you know, we're going to delve deep into this this is basically dealing with shamanic wisdom okay basically connecting the fact that a lot of shamans around the world when they do their ritual um, things and they they take the ayahuasca and things like that they actually go they go into these realms and one of the most prominent symbolics uh, or I'll say one of the most prominent visions that these shamans see are serpents you know what I mean? Are serpents. And these serpents are in con connection with throughout the world and throughout the world cultures with mysticism, knowledge, death, the cosmos, cosmic waves, cosmic energy, and the primordial abyss. Okay. Um, we're going to stop right there. And uh, this is Bitten Phoenix, aka Ab M. Benu. And I will say, I say.